So the first part for the nose, we want to inspect the external nose. We want to make sure that it's straight in the midline, it's not deviated to one direction or the other. Again, looking for swelling and redness. Next, we want to evaluate for nasal patency. So I'm going to ask you to close one side of your nose for me with your finger and inhale. All right, now do the same thing on the other side. Okay. So for this, what I'm going to do is ask you to tilt your head back just slightly for me and then put a little bit of traction on the tip of the nose to open up each nair. Then what I'm gonna do is I'd recommend that you anchor your finger on the patient's face, because again, you don't wanna have a whole lot of pressure of the otoscope on his nose. And then gently insert the otoscope just enough to be past the nasal hairs, and then examine the septum and the turbinates. Now he's breathing while you're doing this, so you either need to ask him to hold his breath or be quick so you don't fog the lens of the otoscope. So I'm going to do the other nair and the same pathway. I brace my finger on his face, insert past the hair, and quickly examine the septum and the nasal turbinates. Again, looking for areas of redness or swelling. So what I'm going to start by doing is ask you to open up your mouth, and I'm going to move your cheek away from your teeth so that I can look all the way around, both anteriorly and posteriorly, but also both the upper and lower teeth, looking at the mucosa all the way around. Now, if you could open up your mouth and touch your tongue to the roof of your mouth. And I've examined the, the mucosa underneath the tongue. Okay. So now we want to be able to evaluate the posterior pharynx. So you ask the patient to open their mouth and look to see how much of the posterior pharynx you can see. If the tongue is in the way, you'll want to use the tongue blade to gently push down the tongue. Do your best not to gag the patient, but occasionally it's not something you can avoid. So if you could open up your mouth and say ah for me, uh, this raises up the uvula, and then gently press down on the tongue until I can see the posterior wall as well as the area where the tonsils exist. So I want to look at it um, in the front, pull the kind of forward so I can make sure I can look behind it for again redness or moles or other lesions. And then again, palpate along uh, the upper part of the pinna and the earlobe, looking for pain or tenderness. We want to pull the pinna gently, superiorly, and posteriorly. Uh, again, this is not a large movement. It's a subtle movement in that direction. And that helps line everything up. When I go to insert the otoscope in, you want to make sure that you can see the tip of the speculum actually inserting into the ear canal before you attempt to look through the otoscope. If I attempt to go in like this and put the scope in, I can't see where I'm going. This also gives me the opportunity to shine the light on the external part of the ear canal and see if there's any abnormalities there. Once I've inserted the speculum into the ear canal a small amount, then I put my eye up to the magnifying lens and adjust the angle of the otoscope until I can see the tympanic membrane first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rub my finger next to your ear um, and I'm going to do it on both sides, and you tell me which ear you're hearing it from. Okay. Before you do it, I recommend that you rub your fingers next to your own ear <laughs> and make sure that you're making a noise. If you use lots of lotion or other things and your hands are kind of damp, you may not make the sound if there's not enough friction. So just make sure that you can hear something. All right, so I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. All right, and tell me which side you're hearing it on. Right. Right. Left. All right, thank you. You can open your eyes. So we're going to start, um, as with any exam, we'll start with a good inspection. So I'm going to look at his face and look and make sure that it's essentially symmetrical, um, that there's no areas of redness, um, no areas that are larger on one side than the other. So if you could tilt your head forward for me, I'm going to look at the pattern of distribution of the hair on his head, um, but as well as I also need to be able to inspect the scalp itself. So I'm going to need to move the hair out of the way in location so I can see the scalp along the crown of his head, if you could turn your head to the side for me, along the side of his head. Again, the other side, thank you. Make sure you're checking both sides. While I'm doing this, I'm looking to see, is again, there any redness in his scalp, um, any lesions, flaking, anything like that. And then I also need to make sure I don't forget the back. And do the same pattern on the back of his hair as well. All right, thank you, you can lift your head up. So I'm just going to press around on your head and see if there's any areas of tenderness or swelling. And you let me know if any of this causes you discomfort. No problems there? So I want to do the frontal sinuses by pressing just above the eyebrow near the midline. Pushing here and here on either side for tenderness. 
And the same thing above the maxillary sinuses or at the area of the cheekbone, pressing down for tenderness. Did that cause any discomfort? No. Okay. So I'm just going to tap on your forehead and your cheeks. You let me know if this causes you any discomfort. Okay. okay. Any pain, discomfort? No. And the same thing on your cheeks. Let me know if this causes you any discomfort. No. Any problem? All right. The front of the ear. So I'm going to place my fingers on either side of his face on the area of that joint and ask you to open and close your mouth. Thank you. Any pain or discomfort? No. Yeah. So I can have palpate both parotids. So I make sure that I've got my fingers over the area of the parotid, which is again the area of the angle of the mandible, and just use a slow rotating motion. Any pain or tenderness in that area? No. no. And then the same thing with the submandibular gland, just up under here, again, a rotating motion for the palpation. Any pain or tenderness? No. Well, now we have to make sure we catch all the different areas of lymph nodes. So the first ones are the ones up in the head. So we have the preauricular lymph nodes, which are anterior to the tragus in the ear, approximately the same location as the temporomandibular joint. So a slow rotating motion there. The next is the posterior auricular, again, just behind the pinna of the ear. Next, we have the suboccipital lobes, excuse me, suboccipital lymph nodes. So if you could turn your head to the side for me so I can demonstrate the location. They're here at the base of the skull at the area of the occiput. Lift your head back up. So I can just reach behind the patient and rotate just below the occipital bone. Next, we have the lymph nodes that are in the area of the jaw. So we have the submandibular lymph nodes, which run along the ramus of the mandible. So palpating up under the mandible. And then the submental lymph nodes, which are here at the tip of the jaw. So then we have the lymph node chains in the neck. The two main chains that we describe are the posterior cervical, which are behind the sternocleidomastoid, but they can start up near the base of the skull. So you start up near the base of the skull and rotate your fingers palpating down posterior to the sternocleidomastoid. You want to make sure you catch at least three locations as you're palpating down that chain. Next is the anterior cervical chain. This is going to be sort of anterior to the sternocleidomastoid. Another important structure that's there is the carotid artery. If I'm palpating on both of those locations at the same time, and if you have an older individual, I'm actually putting pressure on both carotid bodies and carotid sinuses at the same time, that can affect the patient's hemodynamic status cause their blood pressure and heart rate to drop, and cause them to pass out. So in older adults, you generally want to make sure you do not do both of these at the same time. So to be safe, just palpate them one at a time. So I can do the anterior cervical on one side, again, using the same motion in at least three locations, and then the other side. Finally, we have the supraclavicular lymph nodes. These lymph nodes don't drain, generally, objects in the head and neck. They're more um, from the thorax and abdomen, but they're in that location, so generally they're palpated around that same time. They're just superior and deep to the clavicle near where the sternocleidomastoid attaches. So again, here I'm just going to press down deeply on either side in a rotating motion, feeling if there's any masses or lumps. Was there any pain or tenderness in any of those locations? No. Thank you. Uh, finger like so. You can see that his eyes converged, and uh, this is a normal function. Now we will do the confrontation test to test his visual fields. And um, I usually use a pin with a red head because he can appreciate uh, red lights better than anything else. I will come from as far uh, laterally as uh, presumed. Uh, 60 degrees up and nasal and 100 degrees lateral side. So we will uh, start by placing my hand in the mid distance between me and him. Ask him to close his right eye. I will close or put your hand on it. I will close my left eye. Then I will come from mid distance and from out and tell you, tell me when you see the red knob. Okay. And keep looking at my nose. No. Okay. No. Okay. So his uh, visual fields on the left side are uh, good. We should repeat the same test on the other uh, side, which we will not. Now I will present him objects at the same time in his temporal fields to see whether he can. Uh, see them uh, at the same time, or uh, he has visual inattention in which uh, he can only see what happens on one side. So I'm putting my hands in 
temporal fields at the same time, and which hand is moving? The right hand. And now? Left hand. And now? Both. Both. So now he, he, we know that he doesn't have visual inattention. The third component of testing the optic nerve is uh, the fundoscopic examination. I take an ophthalmoscope, and with my right eye, I look at the fundus of his right eye. You, this is because I want to keep my mouth away from his face. So I'll go there, and with my right eye, I look inside his eye into his fundus, look at the vessels, look at the disc, whether it is flat, if it is uh, normal, or he has papilledema, all these things, and you have to report it, and then you come out. And you repeat the same for the other uh, eye. We will do the light reflex since we are at the eyes now, and we will take a torch, and I will shine it into his left eye, and look what happens to the pupil. The pupil became small. So I come out, I place my hand on his face like this, so I shine on the left, and I look what happens to the right. So here we are, we do this, and I'm looking at the other pupil. Normally, the other pupil should constrict also. So this is the indirect response, which is normal in this patient. John, so if you just look at my nose, and we will now bring down the lower lids, inspecting the tarsus, the lids, and the conjunctiva. We'll elevate the upper lids, looking at the lacrimal gland area in this area. And we're going to check also whether or not there is injection or dilatation of the blood vessels in the conjunctiva over the sclerae, noticing the size of the pupils. Procedure, you want to stand approximately two feet in front of the patient, and you'll ask the patient to close his or her right eye as you close your left eye. So, Mr. Johnson, can you close your right eye for me? And I'd like you to look at my nose, and I'm going to close my left eye and look at your nose also. The hands are placed slightly closer to me and in the nasal and temporal fields of the patient's left eye. Mr. Johnson, tell me how many fingers you see now. Three. Okay. And how many fingers do you see now? Four. Okay. Try again. How many fingers do you see now? Three. Okay. What we're doing is assessing the nasal and temporal fields in the lower fields and in the superior fields. Please close your uh, left eye. I'm going to close my right eye. Look at my nose. I'm looking at your nose. And Mr. Johnson, how many fingers do you see now? Three. Okay. And how many fingers do you see now? Three. Good. You can open your eye. Please make sure that when you do this procedure that the hands are closer to you, allowing the person to have the advantage of a larger field, and also that the palms are facing you as you hold up your uh, fingers. We're now going to determine eye alignment and the pupillary responses to light. So David, what I'd like you to do is look in the distance, and I'm going to shine this pen light straight ahead, and I'm going to see where the light falls on individual corneas. We're looking first at the right and the left, and you'll notice that the light falls right directly in the center of the pupil, indicating that the eyes are straight. We're now going to continue on by using our pen light to check pupillary responses to light. And David, just continue to look in the distance as I shine this light from the side and shining it first on the left eye, looking for the direct and then consensual pupillary reflex. And then from the other side, the direct on the right and the consensual pupillary reflex on the left. We're now going to continue to test extraocular muscle function by means of evaluation of the cardinal positions of gaze. Because the red is placed with one finger in front of your nose, and the patient is asked to follow your finger as you go through the six cardinal positions of gaze. David, I'd like you to follow my finger. Okay, don't move your head. And follow it out here. You bring it out to about 15 or 18 inches from midline all the way up here, and now we're testing the inferior oblique of David's right eye, the superior rectus of his left eye. As I bring the finger down, I notice the position of his eyes, 
being careful not to poke the eyes. We're now testing the superior oblique of his right eye and the inferior rectus of his left eye. Bring him back to mid position. We're going to now switch hands. David, just follow my finger as we go all the way to the right, testing the medial and lateral recti. Coming all the way up here, now testing the superior rectus of the right eye and the inferior oblique of the left eye. As we come inferiorly, we'll elevate the lids again to test the inferior rectus of the right eye and the superior oblique of the left eye. We're coming back to mid position. David, I'd like you to watch my finger very carefully as I bring it in close. And we're now testing convergence of the eye. And we will then con and elevate the patient's upper lid as the, rep as the ophthalmoscope is placed against your right eye to examine the patient's right eye. The first thing that you'll notice is the red reflex. If a red reflex is not seen, one has to be concerned that there may be some opacity, such as a cataract, in the lens. As you move closer to the patient, you will turn the lenses to focus deeper as one gets into the eye, past the lens, through the vitreous, and then into the retina. You must always be at eye level with the patient. First visualize superior nasal, inferior nasal, inferior temporal, and superior temporal. And Mr. Johnson, please look at the light. And at that last second, the patient's macula has looked directly at the light, and one is looking then at the fovea of the macula. We repeat the same procedure uh, on the left eye using your left eye and holding the equipment in your left hand. And again, I'm about 15 to 20 degrees off of midline. And keep looking in the distance. And as one gets closer to the patient, the diopter wheel focuses. First, as we go through the cornea, the lens, the vitreous, and now the retina. The optic disc is well visualized, as is the vasculature. Looking superior nasal, inferior nasal, inferior temporal, superior temporal. We want to palpate also. Mr. Johnson, does this hurt at all? Mm -hmm. Okay. Tenderness by pulling on the lobule or the antitragus will provide pain if the person is having an acute otitis externa. We're now going to evaluate auditory acuity, and there are basically two ways of doing that. One by whispering something in the patient's ear, and the second is a tuning fork test. Mr. Johnson, would you take your uh, hand and place it in your external canal and tell me what, uh, tell me what I've said? Train. Train. Okay, and if you now occlude the other canal? Hospital. Hospital. Okay. We're now going to proceed with the evaluation of auditory acuity by a tuning fork test. Typically, one uses a 512 hertz tuning fork. This happens to be 128, which is certainly acceptable, uh, but a 512 is generally the one which is used. There are two tuning fork tests, the Weber and the Rini test. I'm going to demonstrate the Rini test first. Strike the tuning fork by placing it into oscillation by striking the heel of your hand and then placing the vibrating tuning fork on the mastoid process of the patient. Mr. Johnson, do you hear or feel anything? Yes. Okay, tell me when you stop hearing it or feeling it. I stopped. Okay, what about now? Okay, so air conduction is greater than bone conduction, and that's normal. AC greater than BC. The examination is conducted in the other ear as well. And do you hear or feel anything? Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell me when you stop hearing it. Okay. Okay, and what about now? Yeah, I can hear it. Okay, so air conduction is greater than bone conduction bilaterally. The second test is the Weber test. 
and one strikes the tuning fork and places it midline on the patient's forehead, and the patient is asked, do you hear or feel anything? Yes. Okay, tell me what you hear or feel. Uh, vibration. Okay, where do you feel it? Um, both sides of my head. Does it feel equal, or is it in one place louder than another? No, it feels equal. We call that no lateralization, and that is the normal Weber test. I'm now going to demonstrate the otoscopic examination. The otoscopic head is put onto the handle, and the speculum, the largest diameter speculum, is used. In order to visualize the patient's tympanic membrane and external auditory canal in the right ear, the examiner places his left hand on the mastoid process and pulls up, out, and back, thereby straightening the external canal. The instrument may either be held this way to enter the canal or this way. Either way is acceptable. The most important part, though, is pulling up, out, and back to straighten the canal. In doing such, you will straighten the canal, place the speculum into the external auditory canal, and visualize the external canal and the tympanic membrane. You'll notice the malleus, the umbo, the light reflex pointing anteriorly, and perhaps other ossicles in the middle ear. To examine the left ear, the examiner uses his or her right hand to pull on the tragus and earlobe up, out, and back, and the otoscope can be entered into the external canal either as was demonstrated on the other ear or held in this manner, and the speculum is inserted as I'm demonstrating now. We're next going to inspect the nose and the nasal skeleton, as well as the sinuses. Any tenderness here? No. Mr. Johnson? Mm -mm. Any tenderness here? No. Tenderness here? No. And what about here? Any tenderness here? No. This is evaluation of the frontal, maxillary, and ethmoid sinuses. Evaluation of the nose is done by having the person extend the neck and using a light source and elevating the tip of the nose. Now, with the help of a tuning fork, it is struck on the rubber pad and placed on the mastoid process behind the ear, like this. Now the tuning fork is brought in front of the external auditory meters, like this. Now, now I will ask my subject whether he was able to hear the vibrations when the tuning fork was brought in front of his ear. अच्छा आप मुझे बताएं जब वो आपको आवाज आई है जब वो आगे लेकर आए हैं ठीक है इनको आवाज आई है so so in this case if we place the tuning fork the vibrating tuning fork on his mastoid process and then bring it while it is still vibrating in front of his external auditory meters and ask him whether the vibrations are heard. He will say that the vibrations are not heard. जी आपको आवाज आई है जब वो आपके कान के आगे लेकर आए हैं। So we are supposing that in this case his ear has conduction deafness and in this case the bone conduction will become better than the ear conduction and the Rini's test will be negative. So first of all I will show to the two points at which the vibrating tuning fork can be placed. It is either the center of the forehead. That is, place the stem of the uh, tuning fork on the center of the forehead or the vertex of the skull, like this. So now we will uh, proceed with the actual procedure. First of all, strike the tuning fork on the rubber pad and place its vibrating stem on the center of the forehead. Now I will ask my subject whether the sound is heard better in one ear or is heard equally in both. हाँ जी आपको इसकी जो आवाज आ रही है वो दोनों कानों में एक जैसी आ रही है या एक कान में बेहतर आ रही है? एक जैसी आ रही है। So he has said that he is hearing the sound equally in both ears. आपको क्या लग रहा है कि आपको आवाज कहाँ से आ रही है? वो he is saying that the sound is coming from the midline position. So in this case 
he has no uh, con um, conduction deafness or nerve deafness his both ears have normal hearing and he is hearing equal sound of the tuning fork in both ears so you can see that both the subject and the examiner has occluded their left ear and the test of Schaubeck's test will be performed on the right ear of both the subject and the examiner so now we will take a tuning fork, strike it on the rubber pad and place it on the mastoid process behind the right ear and notice the time on the stopwatch. We will start the stopwatch before placing the tuning fork on the mastoid process. Now the subject has indicated or pointed out that he has stopped hearing the vibrations. When the subject points that out, Transfer the tuning fork stem on your own mastoid process and also look at the time. Now the examiner ha has also stopped hearing the vibrations. So in this case you can see that the examiner heard the tuning fork vibrations longer than the subject which shows that the subject has nerve deafness. So, so now we will suppose a condition in which the subject has conductive deafness. In this case, the subject will hear the tuning fork vibrations longer than the examiner. So if we proceed with this, we will see that when the tuning fork is placed on the mastoid process behind the examining ear, and the time is being noted along with, with the procedure, now the subject has pointed out that he has stopped hearing the tuning fork vibrations. You will immediately transfer the tuning fork to your own mastoid process and also check the time. But the examiner did not hear the tuning fork vibrations this time, which means that the subject heard the tuning fork vibrations longer than that of the examiner, which shows that the subject has conductive deafness. Now the examiner will proceed with the absolute uh, bone conduction test. He will strike the tuning fork on the rubber pad, start the stopwatch and place the stem of the vibrating tuning fork behind the mastoid process of the right ear. The subject has pointed out that he has stopped hearing the vibrations when he points it out immediately transfer the stem of the vibrating tuning fork to your own mastoid process and also check the stopwatch now now the examiner is still hearing the tuning fork vibration while the subject has uh, is not so this shows that the subject has nerve deafness the tuning fork will be striked on the rubber pad and its stem or base will be placed on the mastoid process behind the ear. When the subject points out that he has stopped hearing the tuning fork vibration, the time is checked on the stopwatch and the examiner will transfer the stem of the tuning fork to his own mastoid process. But in this case, the examiner did not hear the tuning fork vibrations after the subject had stopped hearing it. So this showed that the subject heard the tuning fork vibrations. It's okay. <laughs> Any um, pain to your head? No. Is this painful at all here? No. No. Painful here? No. Good. Okay. I'm going to look in your ears. Does this hurt when I pull in your ear? No. Does it hurt when I push in your ear there? No. Lovely eardrum, nice and bright. <coughs> it hurt when I pull? No. When I push? No. Yeah, very good. Okay. I'm also going to look in your nose if that's okay. Good. Okay. And then, um, I need to grab a tongue depressor. Your eyes real quick 
your, you notice your eyes red? Mm -mm. You look up for me? Good, and then down. Good. Okay, I'm gonna feel the nodes around your face, okay? Any pain? Mm -mm. Is it okay if I untie your gown a little? Sure. Okay. Is this uh, painful back here? No. Okay. You notice any lumps here by the clavicles? No. I'm just going to feel the true thyroid stock days, okay? Mm -hmm.